And uh, now I get to introduce our preacher for the morning. For the vast majority of in this room, he needs no introduction. Uh, but we're counting on the fact that every week at Hillside, there are going to be new people, people who are coming into this church family. And uh, because you are so important to us, we, wanna, we want you to know everybody who's up front and kind of know who they are and how they fit into our story. Dave Nystrom is a pastor, a covenant pastor. He is a professor at Western Seminary, and he is a a long-time friend of our church, and he's a regular member of our preaching team. And the fact that uh, we have favor in Dave Nystrom's life and heart, and we do, we do. He loves us with a special love. He does is indicative of me that we have favor in God's eyes. And I mean that. God loves us because God has given us Dave Nystrom as our special friend. So come on up here. Well. So uh, I have a... um, run sheet, I think that's what you call it. So a schedule of what's supposed to happen in the service when. So I was scheduled to, to start preaching 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm supposed to end at, at t- uh, 12.05. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a test of the favor um, <laughs> of which Dan spoke. So here, um, here, here's, a, here's, a, uh, here's the deal. Okay, so uh, when I was 12, my dad bought me my first watch. And uh, at that point in our church history, the junior higher sat up front. And the pastor, I had, first Sunday I had the watch on, the pastor, it went over time. <laughs> I looked at the clock in the back and it was 12.01 and then 12.02 and I was pretty sure he just hadn't noticed. So I'm in the first row, and with my brand new watch, I raised my arm above my head and went like this. <laughs> so, so you, uh, we're going to try to move things along <laughs> this, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Pardon? Take your time. <laughs> Not going to take that much time. So uh, n- uh, can we have the first, the first slide? Yeah, so this is a, a Second Timothy 2, and this is the conclusion of quite a bit of material that started in verse 1 of, sec, of Second Timothy 2. You may, know that, remember, may remember there are a couple of images used of an athlete. You know, athletes work hard. They don't just uh, lie around and eat little chocolate donuts before they participate in the Olympic decathlon. They work hard. They train. They discipline themself, themselves themselves. Uh, and Paul ends with this language. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes. Some are for ignoble. And if you have the, the uh, this is the NIV. If you have the NRSV, which is the, uh, the pew Bible, pew, under the chair in front of you Bible, <laughs> um, it doesn't use uh, noble and ignoble. It uses the language of... Um, uh, some for special use, some for ordinary. So these are j- just different uh, variations. I think Tom would say riffs. Is that possible? Riff? I don't really know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> so uh, different variations on, 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 on the Greek. And just, just so you know, uh, maybe this is interesting. I'm already threatening to go past my time limit. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 the new revised is, a, is an update of the Revised Standard Version, which was published in uh, 1946. And the, um, so the NRSV is an update of that. Uh, the NIV, the New International Version, was published in the late 80s. So they're, they're very similar, very close, uh, but the Pew Bible is just the updated version. So it has uh, not noble and ignoble. Next slide. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purpose, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Next slide. 
Yeah, so that's the, that, well, that was it. Those are just those two verses. So now you're being hopeful. Two verses, how long can he go? <laughs> so, um, so let's back up one. Uh, actually, let's back up two, if we could. Oh, no, back, back up two. Now more, four, back up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, and then, uh, and then the next slide. So what do you notice? I have a lot of time. <laughs> what do you notice? Anything strike you about those two? Just two verses. Anything you notice? We have utility, utility for God. We have utility for God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have a choice. Tell me about the choice. To cleanse ourselves. To cleanse ourselves. Yeah. Examine. Examine. Yeah. Yep. Anything else you notice? What's the ladder? What's the ladder? Oh, ignoble. Yeah. Noble, ignoble. But what is that? What's ignoble? Yeah, that's the rest of the sermon, so, yeah. <laughs> sort of. But you're right, it's all those things, right? I mean, he's, he's playing off. There's a whole bunch of stuff in that long list. Okay, next slide. Anything else you may notice about that? Made holy. Made holy. No, made holy. I guess we aren't already. Pardon? Prepared for, good works. Prepared for good works. Yeah. So you, there's the, you know, the potential for what could be done. What could be done through you. So 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I think Trachy was kind of interesting about that or odd or unusual or... What do you what does what do you think? Next slide. Well, I guess we could be not strong in the grace. I don't know. That doesn't strike you as kind of odd. I mean and you can be not strong in the grace. So um, you know, Paul says we are set free from certain things. You know, Christians, we're set free from certain things. Three principally. Uh, ourselves, <laughs> our own evil inclination, right? James says, you want to know why you sin? Don't blame Satan. You are already screwed up enough as it is, you know? <laughs> you, don't, you don't need outside help to, to sin. It's you. You're the principal. Of, you know, it's, it's a, the, the goofiness within you is the principal source. So, so set free from also means we have to live into our freedom. That's the image in the New Testament. We're set free. The jail cell is sprung open. Walk out and explore the life of freedom. Don't crawl back in the jail cell and sit down. And we do that, don't we? We willingly allow ourselves to walk back into the trap we have created for ourselves. Next slide. Yeah, so this is an odd thing in a sermon. Catullus was a, 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 well, the 60s BC in Rome, in the city of Rome, was like the 60s in San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, it really was, it was, it was, uh, there, was there was an elaborate uh, 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 gay culture that developed. There was an elaborate excessive culture that developed. Um, and one, one, one uh, the star of, was a, the poet Catullus. His language is so rude that in older translations, or Latin and English on either side, um, they often just leave the Latin and then put dot, 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 <laughs> you know, on, on the other side. Uh, but here's a, a lovely little poem. He says, basically, I hate her and I love her. I don't understand it, <laughs> but that's the way it is, and I'm tortured. Now there's a very human, very human reality he's touching on, right? We have this wild variation within us. We hate and we love. We want to do good and, and, maybe, the, and maybe you do something heroic and the next second we do something squalid. We have this, we have this, 
this cacophonous set of voices inside us, one to good, one to evil, like Roadrunner cartoons with the, you know, the devil one and the, and the angel one. That's what we're like. Next slide. So it is required to do this. We, we have to be thoughtful. We have to be thoughtful. We have to spend time being thoughtful, make space to be thoughtful, to be honest. It's going to take effort and resolve, right? I mean, you can have all kinds of wonderful intentions, but if you ain't got the resolve, it doesn't happen. You've got to say, no, I am going to get up early and get this thing done. I'm going to, I, I'm going to create a plan and I'm going to stick to it. And if I, don't have the, if I don't have the guts to do it myself, I'm going to create some kind of support system where people call me up. And, I mean, I, I need to know myself and know where my own weaknesses are to make sure there are, because there are, we all need that, to make sure those are, there are those external supports. Resolve requires not just conviction, but it requires not just, not just the moral conviction, but it requires the effort added to it. Next slide. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable, and depending on the translation, I might say men, but the Greek word is anthropos, so like from which we get anth- anthropology. So there's a, that's the Greek word for human. There are, there are Greek words for man and woman, male and female, just like there are Hebrew words for human and man and woman, male and female. So the, the, the word Paul uses is, it, it, it doesn't translate well in English because we have fewer options, but it's uh, uh, interested to reliable people who would be qualified to teach others. No, sir, uh, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. And that word actually is, it comes from uh, husbandry. It's of a sheep that hasn't been sheared in a while and it gets stuck in a thorn bush. And the more it struggles, the tighter is the grip. Next slide. So, and don't get entangled. Yeah, don't get entangled in affairs that are outside the purview of your new life in Christ. And some of those are really obvious. We know what they are, right? And we, we do, I mean, we, well, actually, sometimes we have, a, we have a conversation with ourselves. We're watching ourselves walk on down the road to entanglement. And we hear the voice say, don't do that, don't go there. But we do it anyway. Isn't that what it means to be human? Next slide. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not, does, uh, not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Years ago, 35 years ago, when I was working on the peninsula at a church, uh, we had some uh, students from uh, Stanford who were uh, helping us in the, with our high school ministry. And a couple, it turns out the couple of them were uh, Olympic athletes from the Stanford, uh, female athletes from the Stanford swim team. Holy moly. I, I, there was a couple gold medal winners who were serving in our high school youth group, and, and we, we went on a backpack trip on time, and, and uh, one of them came along, and just watching her swim upstream a river, <laughs> the high school kids, strong football players, being tossed around like, you know, tin cans, and she's going... <sighs> <laughs> it was incredible to watch. Yeah, she competes according to the rules and there's discipline to get there. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Should be? <laughs> a share? That tells you a little bit about what life was like then. The hardworking farmer gets a share. So there's somebody who owns the property. There's somebody who's got the money but the hardworking farmer should at least get a share. Next slide. This is my gospel for which I am suffering. Right, Jesus suffered. And the word suffer, like, like pathetic, patheo is the, is the verb. Um, it, means, it, means, uh, it means hardship, that's true. Um, but it also has that kind of, uh, it's that emotional suffering of being, of being um, uh, conflicted, of wanting two different things, and ch- the struggle to choose the right one. 
So I'm chained like a criminal. Next slide. So present yourselves as a worker approved. This is all the backstory. Not ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Next slide. Now watch out for godless chatter, which leads to more of the same. Watch out for that Hymenaeus and Philetus and what they stand for and stand firm. Next slide. So what do you notice so far? Just all that we've just reviewed. Anything strike you? Suffering. Suffering. Conviction, resolve. Conviction, resolve, and suffering. Dependence. Dependence, yeah. Repentance. Pardon? Repentance. Repentance. Yeah, yeah, that, so that, re, yeah. Um, repentance, that's right. It's more than feeling sorry. It means, the Greek word means to stop, turn around, and go the other direction. Feeling sorry is important, but you have to stop, turn around, and go the other direction, not just turn around. And suffering, yeah. Anybody, you ever wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I would love to suffer today. <laughs> That's what I'd, send me a double <laughs> suffering. You know, uh, Aeschylus at the end of his Agamemnon um, has this line. It's more than a line. It's the will of the gods that those who learn wisdom must suffer. And even in our sleep, pain which we cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until with it, unbidden and against our will, comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. Because suffering is the capacity to stop you in your tracks. And it forces you, or it gives you the opportunity at least, to think deeply about who you are, where you've been, and what you are allowing to form you. And what is being formed in you by whatever that is that you're allowing to form you. Suffering gives you the chance to pay attention. We live in a world that doesn't really want us to pay attention. Next slide. So be strong, that's how it starts. Before we get to actually the passage I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> and then verse 19, be firm. So you can see, boom, bookends. Be strong, be firm. Next slide. So all of this is about grace. Be firm in grace. That's kind of a funny idea, don't you think? Be firm in grace. Next slide. So uh, I, I encountered grace with the Nevada State Police. <laughs> uh, my wife and I, we have been married a year. We're driving across Nevada in the middle of the night, and it was like 3 in the morning, and the Nevada State Police pulled me over, and the trooper came and the, pretty much the final thing, not the final thing, but sort of the middle of his conversation with me was, Mr. Nystrom, you cannot drive 100 miles an hour across Nevada. Because <laughs> I was doing it. I wanted to do it. I still want to do it. <laughs> but Mr. Nystrom, you, you can't do that. And he did not give me a ticket. That was grace. That was foolish on his part. <laughs> foolish grace. So, I, I, I mean, I, could we back up one, one slide? Yeah, back up another one maybe? Yeah, be strong and firm. Now, now go back to the two. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think about, that was just receiving grace. I didn't think there was any effort involved there. So when I, when I think, I think when, when we think about grace, we mean, you know, ease, relax, take it easy. You've been pardoned. Be strong in grace. That's really interesting. Next slide. Yeah, be strong. Stand firm. Strong. So some of you remember Herschel Walker. Um, when he was uh, in college, he was maybe the greatest running back, certainly for a decade. And he, he was a Sports Illustrated cover of him looking like he couldn't get his arms any closer to his body than this, you know. And, uh, and the, the cover said, the title was, My Body is Like an Army. 
And my roommate, I just graduated from college, my roommate Tom Johnson, my best friend growing up, we were, we were rooming together in an apartment, and we got so inspired, because what he said he did is he did 200 sit-ups and 200 push-ups every day. And we said, and we lived a block from a high school, we said, well, that's what we're gonna do. It took us like three months to get there, but we finally got it to the day when both of us did 200 push-ups and 200 sit-ups in a single day, and that was done, then we just went to McDonald's all the time. <laughs> so, so... <laughs> So, but I mean, he was doing it all the time. We just, we just, that was our goal. Once we hit that, we, you know, then became, yeah, we gave it up. Next slide. So, I mean, that, that's the idea of being strong. So, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, also wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, some for ignoble. Now, that actually, that's actually deceptive. Not just noble and ignoble. Um, Think of a large serving spoon in your home. Maybe it's a beautiful silver spoon. Maybe it's your grandmother's. And when you're having a special dinner and there's a roast and, or whatever, and there's a, a spoon to a little gravy, right? That's one. And now think of the shovel you use to pick up the dog poop in the backyard. <laughs> That's the image. Not really nice china that you use once a year and everyday china. But there are some utensils that you use in the home, and there are some that are for purposes that you would, ne- you would never in a million years take that shovel, clean it off, no matter how much you clean it off, and bring it into ladle gravy. <laughs> it's my new ladle, like it? You know, I don't think you're gonna do that. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. So we have a cat, and I do use the spoon from the drawer sometimes if I'm without other options to spoon out her food into her bowl. I know her food is, I I could probably eat it. (laughs) I've never done that. (laughs) But I have this feeling that that spoon needs extra cleaning. (laughs) I don't just put it in the dishwasher, I put it in the sink, but extra, dish soap, sometimes even comet cleanser. (laughs) Next slide. Oh yeah. I came home one day from class and there's my roommate lying on my bed, head at the foot of the bed, shoes off, socks on, partly off, like folded over with them on my pillow. Yeah, that's how I felt. I threw that pillowcase away. Okay, so what, am, what are we saying here? Paul is saying, because we have, this, we have this sense of the communication of stain. It's, it's visceral. It's pre-cognitive. So we have been saved. We have crossed over from death to life. That means don't mess around with the poop shovel. (laughs) That's how serious Paul takes it. We have a responsibility to ourselves, to our community, to God, to walk into, to live into salvation. Right? Paul talks about salvation in, in a triple sense. You ha- we have been saved. We are being saved. For those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then future tense. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Past tense, that's what Christ did for us. But present and continuing action, that's us walking out of, uh, walking out of that jail cell. That's saying, nope, I'm not going to be that kind of utensil anymore. No more. Next slide. So who are you? Who are we? How will we understand ourselves and what should we live into? So I got maybe four minutes for this. Next slide. So who am I? Next slide. Well, we're made for God, but we've lost our way. We are made in the image of God. Angels aren't made in the image of God. You are. 
Don't you know, Paul says, we're going to judge the angels? So what has happened as a result of the sin of our first parents is our status, the ones made to be in the image of God, close to God, well, we, we, we walked away from that. But because of what Christ has accomplished, we are on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And in heaven, at the end of the eschaton, Paul says, we're going to judge the angels. So what's our destiny? It, it's to, we, are, we are made in the image of God and we're made to be in connection with one another. Let's live into that. Let's have a clear focus on that. So God creates the human, ha-adam, in the image of God, Elohim. He creates him male, zakar, and female, unkba. So we are together. There's something about the male-femaleness in creation that mirrors God's image. And he made us for himself. We're the ones that are in God's image. Next slide. So we're not alone. We need each other. Right here in this room, we need each other. Take a look around. Look somebody in the eye. Some of you are not doing what I say. <laughs> now, there's a reason Paul calls the Christian community a family. We're a family. We're a unit. We're not individual consumers at the, at the evangelical drive through we need each other. Next slide. Yeah, and you're a treasure. You may not feel like one. Your family may not think you're one. <laughs> but God sacrificed everything for you. Next slide. And there's something about the complex, our, our, our mind, the, the sapient function, the wisdom function, but also our emotion. Emotions can be true, truer than thought. And we're spirit and we're, we're all of that. And Christ can, can empower and indwell all of that. So what I think and what I feel, these things can be directed. We need to direct them, shepherd them in that right direction. Next slide. So how should we understand ourselves, the less than intended humanity we all live? Next slide. So this is basic, this is basic Pauline theology. We're slaves to three forces. Ourselves, our evil inclination, uh, Satan and, and culture, the world around us, tremendously powerful, tremendously powerful. It shapes us in ways we don't even know. So when I say um, moderation, don't we, don't we Americans think it, it means don't eat too much, don't eat too little? Yes, you should have ice cream for breakfast, just not too much. <laughs> when I taught in Sweden, my students there said, you know, so Dave, moderation means nobody gets too far ahead. Nobody gets too far behind. That whacks out our understanding, doesn't it? <laughs> Think of how culturally conditioned our understanding even of ideas are. So we have, been, we have ma been made for God, we've lost our way, but we are set free. So live into that freedom. Walk out of that jail cell. Next slide. Yeah, so we're slaves to sin, Satan, culture. So just be aware of, of, of all of those factors at work. Culture, I mean, culture is trying really hard to get you to do all kinds of stuff. And one of those things that maybe is not pay attention too deeply. Next slide. So slaves to sin, the penalty and the power. And we each one of us have within us what the rabbis called the yetzer hara, the evil inclination. That's the Satan, the devil, wily e. coyote on the shoulder. But also the power of sin, right? Sin, is a, sin has a cumulative power, right? That's why breaking a habit can take a long time. 
you get used to it. You develop a pattern of sin, first you're, rep you're repulsed by it. After a little while, you start to like it and then you need it. And you can't escape, or it's very difficult. Next slide. So this might be a better, this might, this might capture the point of our passage. Is your mind on earthly things or heavenly things? Next slide. I'm gonna hurry along. Yeah, but we're also slaves to Satan and the powers, the, 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 uh, the evil uh, spirits. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so the cross, at the crucifixion and resurrection, Christ triumphed over the powers. So they, they're defeated, right? That's why Paul can say, you know, does Satan bother you? Just tell him to flee. He has to. He, he is, he, his power is greatly diminished, but he has a really big shadow. <laughs> so we can tell him to flee, and he has to. Next slide. And we're slaves to culture without even knowing it. Next slide. Okay, I can't remember why he's there, but next slide. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know, Nietzsche was, uh, his dad was a Lutheran pastor. And, uh, and his, dad, his dad died when Nietzsche was very young. He died of a horrible uh, brain disease that over the course of maybe three or four years, uh, you know, just, just um, eviscerated him. And, and uh, uh, Nietzsche watched his dad suffer. And some people think that's why he became a sort of a, a lifelong atheist, because he was so angry that there could be a, a God who would let that happen to the best man he ever knew. But he was also worried that, in, that Christianity lost a power efficacy in Europe, that, there, that there'd be no moral system left. And so his idea of the ubermensch, you know, we, to get people to, to aim for something bigger than themselves, that was what he wanted. And he said, if we don't do that, then what will be left? He worried the human beings would settle for the religion of comfortableness and allow themselves to be titillated and amused to death by stuff. And he called such people the last man. Now you may remember there's a book by Francis Fukuyama uh, called uh, The End of History and the Last Men. So in the history is a play on, uh, on Hegel, who said, you know, history works by thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but at some point there's gonna be a final order. And that final order will be when, when all, the, all, this, all the powers balance out and we reach, hum, humanity reaches this, this end point where there's no better way of organizing ourselves. And uh, so, uh, Fukuyama said Nietzsche was right. What we've ended up with is we have tittle, we're, we're amusing ourselves to death by stuff. And, um, and, that, and so that's the end of history. We've reached this place where we've said the most important stuff is, thing is stuff. <laughs> Next slide. And that's what Tim Jackson says. Tim Jackson, I don't think he's a Christian, but he, he teaches sustainable uh, growth at the University of Surrey. An, uh, an economist, and he asked these two questions. Why do we only measure prosperity by GDP? And why was so much stuff are we so unhappy? So, next slide. So, Paul is calling us to turn from all of that. Not that that's evil. Not that that's evil in itself. But what we allow it to do to us <laughs> How we allow it to have an effect on us is where, the, is where the danger lies. We're not sapient about it. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So instead, live into life in the spirit and live into true community. That's what you have here, that you can live into that.
I'm done now. <laughs> so let's, um, let's, uh, let's ask our God who loves us and gave himself up for us to help us keep our eyes on heaven and live lightly on this earth. Father God, we thank you for your love, for your patience, superabundant patience, for seeking to create rescue. Give us the eyes to see your truth, the will to reach out and accept it and the strength of mind and of heart to live into the promise of new life. These things we pray and all God's people said. Amen.